So today we will be talking about green sequence. So this sequence is useful when later we will want to define the quantum dialogram identities from the information from quiver. So first let's just fix our quiver Q and say it has no one cycle or no loops and no two cycles. So that's the standard setup for cluster algebra. First of all we define what's called the framed quiver associated to Q. So this is obtained from Q by adding frozen arrows. So yeah, so originally the quiver Q has no frozen and here we are introducing new frozen vertex so that for each vertex in our original quiver we add a new vertex i prime and i put a square because they are frozen <coughs> so for example if my q originally is 1.22 then q hat will look something like 1.22 and 1 goes to 1 prime 2 goes to 2 prime so yeah the square will be the frozen the one without square will be the mutable vertex. So now let us define what's called a green and red vertex. So <coughs> let us denote R to be the quiver obtained from Q hat by some finite sequence of mutation so of course these are at non-frozen vertex then a non-frozen vertex i will be called green or red If it is uh, in R, let's say a, a non frozen, frozen vertex in R is called green or red, depending on whether it is a target or source of the frozen. So it is not a target of any frozen. So you don't allow any frozen pointing towards your eye. And otherwise, it is called red if it is not the source of any frozen. Yeah, so a vertex will be green if you don't have arrows f pointing from frozen to itself and a vertex is red if it has no arrows pointing from itself towards some frozen vertex. So pictorially, a green vertex, say, so this is green and it ideally can only point outward from frozen. So there may, there may be something that, some frozen that it does not point, but it can only point towards frozen. There cannot have frozen pointing towards it. And red is similar, but it's the opposite. Yeah, so you can have something outside that, that has nothing to do with that vertex. Alright, so remember the information about the frozen vertex is given by the lower part of the extended exchange matrix, right? So if we write i prime 
to be i plus n then the extended matrix will be 2n by n matrix and the lower part of this matrix will capture the information on the arrows between non-frozen and frozen so the lower part of b tilde as we say earlier is really just the c vector the columns of b so the c vectors remember corresponding to the vertex i is a vector and this is just the number of arrows from j to i j prime to i and the opposite direction also and this is just the b j plus n i entry of your extended exchange matrix right. so i mean this this definitely this equation basically just says that you count how many arrows pointing towards i or pointing from i then the main observation is that we all know by now that the c vector is sign coherent so the sign coherence of c vector tells you that actually each non-frozen vertex of r is either green or red Right, because the sign coherence of C vectors tells you that the entries of each C vector has to be either all non-negative or all non-positive, and translating to counting arrows, that just means that either the arrows are all pointing from I or all pointing towards I, and so this is by definition either all green or all red. And as a quick corollary. We see that also mutating at a green vertex we will change it into red vertex. And vice versa. Right. Because I mean, if it is green, then everything is pointing towards the vertex, and then if you mutate there, then all the arrows will flip the direction, so it will become pointing outward, and it becomes red. <coughs> all right. So now that we have definition of green and red vertex, we want to discuss the mutation sequence corresponding to those color. So first, let's fix a mutation sequence. Say the length is n. Then we say that i is reddening. Mm, reddening. i is reddening. If all the non-frozen Vertex of your mutated quiver are uh, red. So by definition, this is mutating your quiver starting from i one to i n of your framed quiver. So if you mutate several times and then the quiver becomes red everywhere so every vertex non-frozen vertex are red then this sequence is called reddening and a mutation sequence is called green if the vertex where you mutate is always green Right, so it means that in initially you mutate, you you have quiver Q hat, and then you mutate at 
I1, then by definition, I1 is green. And then after you mutate, you have a new quiver, and then you mutate at I2, and then the I2 has to be green. So it means that every time you mutate, you are mutating at a green vertex. So then the sequence is called green. And finally, a sequence is called maximal, maximally green. If it is both green and reddening. So this means that you mutate your quiver every time you mutate at the green vertex, and at the end you arrive at the situation where all the vertices are red, and that will be called a maximal green sequence. So a final definition is the notion of frozen isomorphisms. So in frozen isomorphism is just an isomorphism of your quiver which fixes the frozen vertex. Fit or, or fixes all frozen frozen vertices. And then we define the co-frame quiver, which is just like the framed quiver, but you add the arrows in the other direction. So for a frame quiver, you have all the eye pointing towards I prime. And for the co-frame prefer, you have all the i prime pointing towards i. So a main theorem in this direction is the following. It says that if Q admits a reddening sequence, then there exists a unique frozen isomorphism between the quiver where you mutate along the sequence and the co-frame quiver. And this is given by a unique permutation of your vertex. So we will see later some examples on that. <coughs> so if you have a quiver and then you start mutating and at the end you, you arrive at a configuration where at free vertex is red, then this quiver is actually the same as the original quiver but with co framed frozen and the index will be permuted. So let's look at a simple example. So this is the example for type A2. Obviously, we still have our our favorite one two quiver, and then we change it into a co frame quiver, uh, a framed quiver. So you have one point two one prime and two point two two prime. Then you can say mutate at one, and from this you get this new quiver. I mean the the whole thing. And you see that now because one is pointed from uh, pointed by one prime it is red and if you mutate at two again you will get this configuration so one prime points to one and two primes point to two and everything is red in this situation or you can start by mutating at mu two first so you see that here one points to both primes so it is a source so it is uh, green and two is red because it has pointed by two prime and you mutate here, you see that the color of one will change by definition because you are mutating at one, so you change its color. But here, it will also affect the colors of the other vertex, so two will also change the color. And finally, you mutate at two, you get this configuration, and you see that these two quivers are isomorphic by swapping one and two. So it's frozen isomorphic. And both of the sequence 1, 2 and 2, 1, 2 will be 
a maximal green sequence. So maximal green sequence is not unique, as you can see here. So one two is both green. Two one two is also both green. So a large class of example can be obtained from a C click through. So let Q to be a C click. So it means that it has no oriented cycle. Then a sequence is called a source sequence. If well, every step you mutate is a source. So its source sequence is that first of all it has to cover all the vertex of your quiver, and that each vertex you mutate is the source of the corresponding mutated quiver. Ah, I mean, that, that's the original. <coughs> so you just look at the quiver before the frozen, you just look at the quiver queue, and every time you are mutating at a source of that sequence, or of that quiver, and your mutation should cover all the vertices. Then you can actually <coughs> see that a source sequence is always a maximal green sequence. So the idea is definitely induction. The proof is kind of contract as as follows. So say if my source sequence, if I re-enable the vertex to be one, two, three up to n, then you can use by induction on K to show that the green sequence on the green vertex after you mutated that many times are uh, precisely the one that you haven't mutated yet. So this is by induction. So every time you mutate the remaining green vertex will be the one that you haven't mutated yet and then you just keep on going. So, of course, a large class of acyclic quivers, as we already studied, is coming from thinking diagrams. So let's. So in in our case here, we are studying only skew symmetric case. So the thinking diagram will be ADE type. So let's say simply this. So ADE type, <coughs> and then we orient the arrow so that it is orient, it is alternating. So it has all, all the vertices are either sync or source. So if all the vertices are either sync or source, and you can see that the sinks and all the sinks will commute with each other because they have no arrows between sinks, and all the source come with each other so we will denote the set of all source by say i plus and i minus to be the all things then the theorem or the result the main result is that the two sequence given by concatenating the source and sync and the other concatenating sinks and source but with h many times, where h is the cosecant number. Then these two will be 
to maximal the green sequence. <coughs> right. So we previously have seen a sp very special case, which is uh, type A2 case. So in type A2, the H number, the quotient number is free. So in this example, the source is one, the sink is two. So according to the result, one, two will be a maximal green and then 212 which has three factors will be another maximal green so maybe i can show a bigger example so this time it corresponds to a type a5 or in other words sl6 and h is 6 I'm oh, sorry, H is 5. No, H is 5. Oh, sorry, this is just the source sequence. Anyway, um, this example is the, the first i equals i plus i minus. So you are mutating at the source, and the source in this case is 2 and 4. And the i the sinks in this case is one three five, and we know that two four one three five will be a uh, maximal green sequence. And you can see here, if you put here two and then four. Three at uh, one three five, you will get a reddening sequence. And also, kind of special in this case is that the frozen isomorphism is just the identity. It does not permute your vertex. So another good source of quiver admitting maximal green sequence is the square product. So as I said, this is just the cross a uh, direct product of two quiver, and we reverse all the arrows. So as, let's say as, as Griffin. So it, it, it's a standard cross product of quivers, and you reverse all the arrows of the first quiver and second quiver, where I is the sink. Q1 and I prime is source of Q2. <coughs> and we say that a vertex is even if the pair, so if, if the vertex in the cross product is a pair of either source, source. Or sync sync. So we will denote it by a white circle and it belongs to the set I plus. And it is called odd if otherwise. So either source sync or sync source. And we will we'll denote it by black vertex and use i minus to denote that. So to just have a look at an example. So this will be a cross product of a thinking diagram of type uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, D5. And also a quiver here. So this is type A4. So this is the arrow. Then the sink of Q1, which is D5, the sink of Q1 will be, say, uh, this one will be a sink. This will be a sink. This will be a sink. And then we reverse 
all the arrows that belongs to hmm? oh sorry I think I switched the so a this is a4 square d5 so this is a sink this is a sink and then we reverse all the arrows corresponds to this sink so the new one I draw will have an opposite arrow of the op of the original d5 <coughs> and also then the even odd corresponds to the pair source source or sink sink so for example this vertex corresponds to a sink and a sink so it is a even vertex and then you can see that this will have an alternating sliver on your quicker so this will be this is the square product then the statement of the main result here is that again there will be two maximal sequence maximal green sequence so either it has h1 factor or you have i minus i plus H2 factor. So this will be maximal green sequence. So again, H1, H2 are the cosetter number of the corresponding quiver. So you can try to play around with this. All right. So one last class of example I want to discuss will be the case corresponds to double broad cells, and actually a special type of double broad cells. So the one that is only say uh, upper triangular. So this double broad cell, the first word is the identity word, so we don't care, and the second word is any element in the while group. So we saw last time that from this data we can construct a quiver encoding the cluster structure, right? Where i is the reduced word of w, because we don't have the first word. Uh, I mean reduce expression of W. Then a theorem by guys McClure Schwer says that the mutable part of your quiver of your graph admits a maximal green sequence. <coughs> yeah. Although the construction for different words will have different algorithm, so let's try to see an example corresponds to type A5, where we choose W to be the longest element, the standard one. So let's look at the example in the applet. So in this example, we have the quiver corresponds to type A5, where we choose our longest word, W0, to be the standard one, 54321, So if you look at the mutable part of this quiver, then what we get will be the red triangle in the middle. So this will be our quiver. Then to get the frame quiver, we add the frozen nodes corresponding to each uh, vertex. So those will be the blue uh, frozen nodes here, where each arrow points towards them. So in this applet, 
you can actually turn on what's called the traffic light. So this will give you whether the vertex is a red or a green vertex. So if we switch it on, then by definition, this is the frame prefer. So every vertex is green because it only has arrows pointing towards a frozen vertex. So the theorem says that we can uh, find a maximal green sequence for this quiver, and the sequence is actually quite easy to get. So you basically start from seven and then go one by one across the whole quiver. Every time you are clicking on a green vertex, so this is a green sequence. So after completing the first round, you will have six green and four red, and you reduce the rank by one and you repeat your sequence again every time pressing the green vertex. So in the end, you will get everything red. So this is a red thinning sequence and also a green sequence. So it is a maximal green sequence. And also by the previous result, we know that this quiver should be frozen isomorphic to our starting quiver. So let's say if I switch three and two, and then I switch four and six, and I switch 10, 7, 9, 8. We see that we get back our previous quiver, but this time it is a co-frame quiver where every frozen is pointing towards the vertex. And from this, you can read out the frozen isomorphism, which is a permutation, permuting 2 and 3, 4 and 6, 7 and 10, as well as 8 and 9. So that will be the example corresponding to this theorem. So one question about green sequence is that it seems for many class of example, it captures some good properties of the cluster algebra. So for example, upper cluster algebra implies upper, I mean, the upper cluster algebra and cluster algebra, cluster algebra coincide and so on, or finally generated and so on. So it is natural to ask whether this property is actually intrinsic to the cluster algebra itself. because it seems like it captures some good properties of the cluster algebra. Or in other words, does there, it is, is the max, if it exists, or is the existence of maximally green sequence preserved under mutation. Because if it is an uh, intrinsic properties of a cluster algebra, then if you have a maximal green sequence for one quiver, then if you mutate to some other quiver, you should expect also maximally green sequence there. But it turns out that the answer is false. So there are examples where a maximally green sequence uh, exist, but if you mutate several times, you will have a new quiver where a maximally green sequence does not exist. So an example is produced by considering a rank-free quiver. So first of all, a theorem is that Oh, no, maybe I should give, give the example first. Yeah, so an example. <coughs> so let QABC to be the rank free quiver. Like this. So the ABC will denote the number of arrows. Not, not the multiplicity of weight, just the number of arrows. <coughs> then one can show that this quiver does not admit a maximally green sequence if all the numbers a, b, c is bigger than or equal to 2. However, you can check directly that the quiver 2, 2, 3 is mutationally, mutationally equivalent to and a cyclic quiver. And as we saw previously, it 
has a maximum green. A, a cyclic crypto always has maximum green sequence. Right, so a very quick mutation. So if you're two, two, three, and say you mutate at here, then you will get you reverse the arrows here, and this becomes this one. And let's say now you rotate here, then you will get this, which is an acyclic curve. <coughs> so this gives a complex sample of the above statement. But luckily, the weaker statement holds. This is a statement due to mirror. So it says that the, the actually the existence of reddening sequence is okay. So if the quiver admits a reddening sequence, then each quiver mutation the equivalent to Q also admits reddening sequence. So we know that the maximal green sequence is not intrinsic to the cluster algebra itself, but <coughs> let's also finally just talk about how one can construct such a maximal green sequence. Or how one can restrict your sequence. So you're kind of studying extension of quivers. So whether you can get maximal green sequence from a smaller subquiver and vice versa. <coughs> so this we will introduce the notion of triangular extension of a creeper. So let Q be your fixed creeper and Q prime, Q prime prime, to be some fixed, uh, to be some full subquivers. So full subquivers means not just the vertex but all the, also the arrows is <coughs> within the creeper itself. So we say that. The bigger quiver is a triangular extension of the smaller one. So it's a triangular extension of Q prime by Q prime prime. If the vertex set is just a disjoint union of the two vertex set and no arrows are pointing from Q0 prime prime to Q0 prime. So if you write down the ex the exchange matrix, it's just like a block triangular matrix. So you only have one, you have an error from prime to prime prime, but not the other way. So if you just write it out, it becomes like a <coughs> triangle matrix, tri triangular matrix. So the main result in this aspect is that if Q have maximally green or just reddening sequence for Q, then you can restrict this sequence to your subquiver. So this statement tells you that if you know a quiver has having a maximal green, then you know that all its full of quiver also has a maximal green or, or reddening. Again, the idea here, I will just write down the construction. So given a maximal green sequence or reddening sequence for the original quiver, you basically just ignore all the mutating vertices which have arrows joining the frozen vertices of 
the complement of the script of the subgrifon. So you have a sequence and then you look at you look at the vertex and if this vertex has arrows pointing towards the complement then you eat not that vertex and the remaining subsequence will be a maximum ring sequence for the sub subgrifon. So this is the restriction and of course we also have the extension which we will use the triangular extension we have. So if your quiver is a triangular extension of Q prime and Q prime prime then Q has a maximal sequence if and only if q prime and q prime prime has one so, and one direction is already given by the theorem from the ruler from uh, from above and here you give another direction where if you have two maximal green sequence for q prime and q prime prime then you can combine them in some way to get a maximal green sequence for q Right, so this is kind of a very brief summary to the theory of uh, green sequences. And in the next class, we will introduce the special function, the dialogarithm, and also the quantum dialogarithms, and see how the existence of maximal green sequence will help us construct some uh, identities. Uh, the famous one, the Pentagon identities, solving the Pentagon relations. We have all these five term relations so far in our course so you should expect some kind of functions or operators non-commutative commutative will have some five term relation and this will be constructed using quantum dialogarithms and corresponds to maximal green sequence for Griffiths. all right that's it for this class <laughs>